Well, hey, I'm so glad that you're joining me for this bonus teaching content video. We try to do this whenever we come across a scriptural issue that just warrants a little bit more discussion, a little bit more explanation. What we believe about the Bible is it's authoritative, it is inerrant, but also we acknowledge it is at least a 2,000-year-old document written in two dead languages by a whole bunch of different authors. And so occasionally in the scriptures, we're going to come across something that just needs a little bit more study and a little bit more attention to really understand. And we believe at Pulver Rock, every believer should be equipped to do that sort of study. So that's what we're doing today. And I touched on an issue recently out of Ephesians chapter 5, where Paul talks about submission in marriage. Now, what we commonly hear about these verses is that wives should submit to husbands. But I actually, when I talked about it, talked about it the other way, that husbands should submit to wives. And that's what I want to dive into and just give a little bit of explanation about. So if you have a Bible, find Ephesians 5, and we're going to start in verse 21. And I'm going to read this out of the NIV, which will become relevant in just a second. But here's what Paul writes in Ephesians 5, 21. He says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, this is Paul the Apostle. Paul was single, which is relevant, but he writes quite a bit actually about marriage, and that's what he's doing here. So he's starting to talk about relationships and about marriage relationships, and he gives us this summary sentence that out of our reverence for Christ, we should do this thing called submit to one another. Now, the Greek word he uses there, of course, he's not writing in English, he writes in Greek, and he uses this Greek word, hypotasso. Uh, what, what that word basically is, is it's an ordering word. It's about prioritization. And so the concept is, in a relationship, we are encouraged to put the other person's needs and wants ahead of our own. That's really what he's talking about, ahead of in order of importance. Now, I don't think he's encouraging codependency here. He's not saying lose yourself in the other person, but he's saying because you're secure in Christ, because you're fully loved, because you're accepted by him, out of our relationship with Jesus and, and the security that we have there, we're to value the other person. Another way to think about this is the opposite. So the opposite of hippotasso that he's talking about there that we translate as submit is when we would like make everything about ourselves. So he's saying don't do that in your relationships. Instead, value the other person because you're secure in Christ. And you will note that that verse, Ephesians 5.21, says one another. It's a one another command. So this is a command that is going to apply to both people in a marriage, both the husband and the wife. So husbands, this is where I get this, submit to your wives out of your reverence for Christ. That's what he's saying. And wives, submit to your husband out of your reverence for Christ. And so the summary of everything that Paul is about to say is a concept that I would describe as mutual submission. It is everyone submitting to everyone else. Or another way to think of that is everyone valuing everyone else. So should wives submit to their husbands? Well, absolutely. That's for sure in the text. But should husbands also submit to their wives? Absolutely. That is for sure in the text. Now, after he says that summary statement, he starts to apply it and expound on it to both wives and then to husbands. And so to the wives, he says Ephesians 5, verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husband as you do to the Lord. Now, what's really fascinating about this verse is in the original Greek, um, that word hypotasso that we translate as submit, it actually does not uh, appear. And so it just says, the wives to their own husbands as to the Lord. And it's unclear. Well, what, what are they supposed to do? And the translators look at the previous verse or the previous sentence where the verb is hypotasso. And they say, well, that is what he is dragging forward into this sentence. So it's correctly translated, but also it's worth noting, you could not read Ephesians 5.22 and understand what Paul is talking about without first reading Ephesians 5.21. Now, you may look at that and say, well, Jonathan, I'm just, uh, I just have the English Bible. How do I even figure that sort of stuff out when that is what the translators are doing? Well, I want to recommend a resource to you. Uh, it, it is a very technical sounding name, but it's a really simple concept. It's called a reverse interlinear Greek New Testament. 
And if you go on Bible Gateway, uh, which is a popular online Bible, there's all sorts of different translations of the Bible. And one of the ones that you will find is called the Mounts Re Reverse Interlinear Greek New Testament. So Mounts, M-O-U-N-C-E. Uh, and what it has is it will have the English on the top and then on the bottom, it will have the actual Greek and then a transliteration of the Greek. And you will see in that uh, the, the word hypotasso doesn't appear. It's actually missing from that section of scripture. But the concept is still valid that wives should submit to their husbands uh, because this command to submit to one another obviously includes the wives. But then he applies it differently to the husbands. Look at verse 25. Same idea, submit yourselves one to another. Wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So again, you see this kind of ordering of things, this lay down your life for her sake. That's what he's teaching. And you can go on and read about this, uh, this whole chapter and what he says about marriage here in Ephesians 5 is really quite beautiful. It is full of mutuality and intimacy and vulnerability. It's incredible insights for a man who wasn't married about what marriage is. But then right at the end, he says, all this is a mystery, meaning everything he said about marriage, but I am talking about Christ and the church. And so he, he says all this beautiful stuff about marriage, but he says really what that is about is the way that Jesus loves us and that we love Jesus. So let me hit you with a few things that are really relevant as we do study in a passage like this. First, we have to consider culture. Culture, the culture that is being written to is relevant. Paul is writing to what I would say is an obscenely patriarchal and misogynistic culture, and that would be Greek culture. There's a lot of history written on this subject, and I can recommend some uh, resources if you want some, but uh, especially Greek women, as compared to Roman women or Jewish women, were uh, controlled in, in just a, kind of an obscene way in Greek culture. They were oppressed in some very intense ways, and husbands literally had over their wives the power of life and death. Like that was a, almost like a legal privilege that husbands had. And so one thing to be aware of is he's writing to Ephesus. No one would have been shocked by that first statement of, of wives submit to your husbands. It's like, well, that, yeah, of course, that's what is the expectation. But they would have been blown away by the next statement about husbands laying down their lives for the sake of their wives, like that was revolutionary. This stunning call to these Ephesian men to sacrifice and to submit for their wives, uh, which I think makes it particularly sad that we in the evangelical church in the U.S., we have used these verses to really teach that submission is exclusively the role of the wife. Because not only is that not justifiable from this text, but it misses the beauty of what Paul is doing here to really challenge these Greek men. That's what this text was really about. Second thing we need to note as we read something like this, it's uh, the word pericopes. Pericopes just refer to the little headings that are in our Bible. The, the, usually they're bolded, they're not a part of the text, but those headings were actually inserted by publishers later. So the headings are not the Word of God. The Word of God is what comes between the headings. The headings were inserted by publishers just to help us be able to read our Bible a little bit more easily. And so in the NIV, if you're reading out of an NIV Bible, you'll see the heading instructions for Christian households and that become or that happens right before Ephesians 5 21 where Paul says this summary statement of submit yourselves one to another out of reverence for Christ uh, there are other translations like for instance here I have the ESV now the ESV treats it very differently the the pericope in the ESV is entitled wives and husbands and they actually put it after verse 21 but before verse 22 and so if you're reading the section on wives and husband Husbands, you would start with verse 22, wives submit to your own husbands as unto the Lord, which, as I mentioned, in the original language would be impossible to understand what Paul is talking about if you started there. And so it really begs the question, well, why would they put the pericope right there instead of putting it at the beginning of the thought, which is Ephesians 5.21? Now, I don't want to speculate. It could be bias in the text. I don't, I, I don't know that for sure. I just want us all to understand this, uh, that those pericopes are not the word of God. 
And so sometimes we, we come across them and they might send us off down the wrong road in terms of interpreting the text. So I honestly, I mean, you could just cross them all out and it wouldn't be a big deal because sometimes we just need to let the text stand for itself instead of reading the bias of the publishers into the text. Now, I'm bringing all that up because, not because I wanna undermine your confidence in the scriptures, but because I want us to build our confidence that we can understand this stuff. These are not impossibly hard things to know. We just have to find the resources that tell us what is happening behind the scenes before the printed English word comes into our hands. Translators do, they have a hard, hard job. And I think they do it diligently and faithfully. Uh, what we just need is resources that tell us some of the decisions that they've made that give us the English version of our Bible. Um, and when we find resources like that, we can hear those decisions and that can help us be able to hear a little bit more clearly from God. There are better resources now than ever before about understanding our English versions of the Bible. And so we need to press into those and be diligent in our study of those. And sometimes it takes a little bit more work than maybe you or I would prefer, but the work is worth it and it's redemptive work. Let me just close with just a handful of just conclusions on this. I, it, I just have three things that we just need to stand out to us from this text. First, if, if someone uses the Bible to draw the conclusion that God has empowered me to control another person, they are probably wrong, right? That, that application of the text that God is empowering me to control someone else is almost always wrong. And so if anyone teaches these passages by saying that husbands have been empowered by God to control their wives and their wives just have to submit to it and accept it because the husband is the leader in the marriage, that is an abuse of Scripture. And I know that is a strong statement, but if we interpret this correctly, it is a true statement. That is an abuse of what Paul is saying. God never, as a general rule, empowers us to control others. Authority is something that he at times will give us. God holds all authority and at times he entrusts it, like he entrusts it to parents over their kids or to government leaders over their populations, that sort of thing. But a biblical authority is never about me controlling you. Biblical authority is rooted in sacrifice for the good of the people that God has put you in authority over. That is the core of biblical authority. And so whenever someone reads a text like this and they come to the conclusion where I get what I want, I get control, uh, that is them reading their bias into the text. And we all do that. Uh, it's natural to do. We just have to acknowledge it and we have to study enough so that we know when it's happening. I've heard pastors, pastors I know, who have taught out of this passage that husbands occasionally have the freedom because of texts like this to kind of put their foot down in marriage and say to their wives, listen, I'm the husband, I'm the leader of this marriage, and so the Bible tells you that you have to submit to what I've decided and that that is at times a legitimate thing for a husband to do. Now, men who teach that out of these verses, I believe that they really want that to be true. I believe that is their bias, but they cannot blame their Bible for that desire because their Bible tells them they need to submit. They need to hippotasso their wife, her needs, her wants, her desires, and they need to lay down their life on a daily basis for what she wants. That is the true teaching of the scripture. Second thing, uh, if you're married, uh, realize that the biblical ideal here for marriage is all about mutuality and looking after each other. That is what Paul is encouraging. Husbands should do that for their wives. Wives should do that for their husbands. I think sometimes we get caught because we tend to think of marriage as like this. It's like it's a power struggle between two people. That's not what it's intended to be. And so Paul is not speaking to that power struggle. He is speaking to the ideal of marriage, which is this mutuality and this partnership that's rooted in sacrificial love. And so we get stuck, though, because of just humanness, brokenness. And we often get this question asked, um, what happens like if one spouse wants to do something and the other spouse doesn't want to do that? Like what happens if you have that sort of a disagreement where you're just at an impasse? Who wins? Who does the Bible say should win? What I want to suggest, based on what Paul teaches here, 
is that if you get to that impasse and one of the people in the marriage wins, what really happens is you both lose. I think that is the true teaching of the scripture. Paul's picture of marriage is that you love Jesus so much and that you're constantly engaging in this sacrificial love, this selfless love of one another. And so if you're ever at an impasse with your spouse, which happens from time to time, I, I think the question, the biblical question, is what would a mutually submissive, selfless love require of me? That's the question that Paul's driving us to. And whatever a mutually submissive, selfless love would require of us, do that. That is the answer of what to do. Paul doesn't let husbands off the hook by saying, you get what you want and she has to submit. He also doesn't say that to the wives. The wives get what they want and he has to submit. He is pointing us back to this mutually uh, submissive love. Last thing, don't forget, at the end of all this stuff about marriage, what Paul says is, I'm actually talking about Christ and the church. And so this picture of beautiful marital love, of sacrifice, of valuing uh, the, the other person's needs above your own, of laying down your life for the other person, that that actually is a picture of how Jesus loves us. He loves us in that way. He doesn't love us in a way that is controlling or manipulative or demanding. That's not how he loves us. He loves us in this way that Paul is talking about, this sacrificial sort of love. And I think if we let ourselves feel that love for us where he's laid down his life for us and is sacrificed for us if we let our hearts feel that we will feel wonder we will feel awe we will feel reverence and that brings us back to the beginning Ephesians 5 21 out of our reverence for this Jesus who sacrifices and loves us with grace and mercy could we love each other the same way could we value one another the same way. That is the picture out of this passage. In light of our reverence for Jesus, could we put one another first? That's the teaching here. Um, it's a really fun section of scripture. I encourage you to study it. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out. I'm glad you joined me today. I want you to know this. I love you people, but I also want you to know this. More importantly, Jesus loves you. He loves you well. And so in light of that, could we love one another well?